related. Um, first of all, with relation uh, to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, the university mounted a response early on to try and understand the impacts of the oil spill. And my particular group was looking at the impacts on the lower trophic food web, so phytoplankton and zooplankton. Um, in the process of doing um, these analyses, we also realized that the plankton and environmental impactors also affected um, or led to a deposition of oil to the deep sea. The challenges in studying um, this region is that there was almost no baseline data. So it was very difficult to tell what the impacts are unless you understood what happened typically, what were the typical patterns before the oil spill. So that's been an issue. Um, also, it's over a very large spatial scale, so there's a lot of spatial tempor temporal variability. So we completed uh, 13 cruises in the northern Gulf region um, between May of 2010 and August 2014 and used a whole suite of measurements on these cruises. And in particular today, I'm going to be talking about a camera imaging system, um, CTDs and chlorophyll fluorescence sensors. This was the study area. The Deepwater Horizon site is just offshore of the Mississippi River outflow. There's what's called the DeSoto Canyon. It's a major feature, um, bathymetric feature in the region. And the station, the data I'm mostly going to be showing you um, are these kind of off-shelf to deep water stations. And for those of you who are new to the state of Florida, the oil spill took place up in that upper corner of the Gulf of Mexico. So this is um, the camera system that we use that was designed and built here in the college. And it works. Um, you put it on a towed platform, and as you're towing forward, zooplankton travel through the sampling tube the light source is on this side and the cameras on this side. So what we're actually getting are images of the shadows of the organisms. So animals that are fairly translucent, like jelly plankton, we get a lot of detail and then very dense animals, we might get more of an outline, um, but it works pretty well. And this is, just shows you a picture of some of those early May cruises out in the oil spill. Here's our towed platform and um, the camera systems on here. And here are some images of some of the zooplankton and fish that we collect. And here's some of these detrital particles that were very abundant in the area that I'm going to show you some data for. So the oil spill. Um, took place between late April and late July. We went out and sampled in August. That was about the first time that we could um, get out there, uh, besides the May cruises. Um, and during that time period, um, the oil was spatially variable, but the highest frequency of oil occurring in any particular location here you can see in red. We know that oil sank to the seafloor based on coring um, that were done by people in this college, Dave Hollander and his group, and that, that the oil that ended up on the seafloor was spatially variable. But we know that it's there, and the estimates are somewhere between 10 to 14 percent of the Deepwater Horizon oil sank to the seafloor. There's a lot of debate on what that number actually is, um, higher and lower, um, and I'm sure that debate will be ongoing for a while, but we know that something caused that oil to sink. And this was an unexpected event, so it received a lot of attention. So the mechanism by which oil sank to the seafloor are these particles of marine snow. Marine snow occurs everywhere in the world's oceans. It's formed primarily in surface waters, but you can see these particles all the way to the seafloor, 3,000 meters deep, they're everywhere. They are formed primarily by phytoplankton and zooplankton in surface waters. They, um, as phytoplankton age and die, senesce, 
They release sticky substances that make them stick together, and through just turbulent water action, um, pushes these sticky particles together, making bigger and bigger aggregates. They're colonized by bacteria. Small zooplankton will even sit on these large particles, feeding on the bacteria and the organics. Larger zooplankton feed on the bacteria, and, and little zooplankton will break up the particles. So there's this continuous dynamic of these particles coagulating together and then being broken apart. Um, there were unusually large particles during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, and here you can see a long mucousy strand that was um, based on experiments were probably formed by bacteria that were degrading the oil. But um, you normally don't go out in the ocean and see these big fluffy things at the surface. That was unusual. So that got our attention when we out there. And you can see we did capture these particles. Um, with the camera system we are using it. And for those in, of you in the front row, you can even see little things sitting on the particles, eating those particles. So we've analyzed all of these cruises of image data. And just to show you some of the vertical distributions, during August, so it was within about two weeks after the wellhead was capped and there was still oil present in the water column. Most of that oil was in the upper 20 meters. These marine snow particles were most abundant near the surface layer, right in this low salinity lens. So during the oil spill, they released, they opened the diversionary channels up here in the Mississippi River, which let out a lot of fresh water over this whole area. So it was a very shallow uh, freshwater lens in the area. Um, chlorophyll, a uh, proxy for phytoplankton, were most abundant also in this freshwater lens, helping to create the marine snow. And zooplankton were also most abundant, closest to the surface. Now remember, they contribute to the marine snow formation as well as break it up. So this was a very high particle concentration. Um, we've looked at these distributions for all the following summers. And um, the distribution during that August was much higher than any of the subsequent years. Um, the peaks, also the integrated values. There was lots of spatial variability. Uh, here is our transect, and I've jumped to August 2013 for this example. Um, but this 2013 was another year of high river flow, but there was no oil present. Um, we saw higher abundances of marine snow during um, August 2013, so high river flow has a lot to do with the formation of marine snow in this region. Um, but So you can see closest to shore, there were high particle concentrations in the upper 50 meters. Um, this is the Deepwater Horizon site, so there's very high particles, and that's also somewhat closer to the mouth of the Mississippi River. And then we see particle concentrations deeper, um, which are closer to the shelf break and may represent sediment resuspension as well. There was, again, lots of interannual variability, but not just looking at the abundance um, or the vertical distribution, but if we look at the sizes of particles, so this is a size frequency spectrum, we saw many larger particles, but most of the particles, frankly, are really little tiny things that are hardly visible. But there was a lot of variability between years, but again, during August 2010, which is in red, we had the high, this is a log scale, we had the highest abundance of small particles <coughs> during the oil spill, and also saw um, higher abundances of larger particles. So for a number of reasons, this um, the um, oil seemed to have an impact on this whole system in terms of marine snow. And this just shows you the size distribution with depth. So before I showed you a total composite, just a total of particles, but if we look at size di distribution, you can see the smallest size particles tend to remain suspended, and the bigger size particles sink fairly rapidly out of the water column. And these are the particles that likely um, co had um, collision with oil droplets and distributed that oil to the seafloor. 
So we're in the process now of um, analyzing all of these data. We're looking at all the environmental data as well. Uh, this is the median size particle um, and the size distribution of particle with depth. But you can see that this big lump of particles coincides very nicely with the fluorescence profile. Here you can see a peak in the fluorescence, um, as well as this salinity feature here. Um, and it also peaks in the same place as the turbidity maximum. Uh, and this is during February, when there's relatively low flow um, out of the Mississippi River. So we're going back and looking at all of these seasons, looking at interannual variability um, in part to um, better understand how the marine snow abundance and distribution impact the um, sedimentation of oil to the seafloor during the deep water rising event, but also if there's another oil sp spill sometime in the future, how might we predict um, whether or not there might be another sedimentation event. What's the likelihood of that occurring? And we think the fact that there was a large oil sedimentation event during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill was due to a sort of a nexus of events, kind of like Superstorm Sandy, in that the Deepwater Horizon site was located right next to the Mississippi River outflow, so it's one of the most productive areas in the Gulf of Mexico. It occurred during spring and summer when the system was really revved up, and we normally see a lot of marine um, detritus, marine snow. Because they left the diversionary channel, the Mississippi River open, releasing a lot of fresh water and nutrients that contribute to enhanced phytoplankton growth, uh, enhanced zooplankton growth, and therefore marine snow. And the presence of oil increases microbial mucus formation. Um, particularly in the presence of weathered oil. So this work is ongoing, and we're also doing a lot of work with zooplankton and phytoplankton as well, but I don't have time to talk about that today because I'd like to tell you a little bit um, about our work in McMurdo Sound. So McMurdo Sound is way at the southern end. Let's see, do I have a... I do. Good. Way at the southern end. Oh, I forgot to mention my... All my co-PIs, most, um, most of them are from different institutions in California. Um, they've been a great group to work with. Um, many of them have worked in the Antarctic for decades. Um, so the, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Antarctic, um, so this is the Antarctic Peninsula, and the Ross Sea is at the very southern end of the Pacific Ocean. So where we're working is at the very southern end of the Ross Sea. Uh, the continent is up here. This is part of the continent, Victoria Land. Um, Ross Island. McMurdo uh, Station is one of the major US stations, if you're familiar at all with Antarctic activities. And McMurdo Sound itself is in this region. So it's bordered by Ross Island, Victoria Land, and then the Ross ice shelf. So this is just a huge thick ice shelf in the back of it, back of the sound. And this area is similar to the area of Tampa Bay. So we, our question was a predator-prey analysis. Uh, we also, in order to do that, we also did physical oceanography. Um, we just finished, um, submitted a paper on the fast ice dynamics of this region, because uh, they're particularly critical to um, the marine food web. So our research question was, does this large fast ice region, so most of the year it's covered by ice, fast ice is sea ice that is attached to land. And does it act as a prey um, refuge for, uh, from air breathing predators? So the prey that we were um, investigating are small shrimp-like creatures called krill and um, a fish, a very abundant fish in the region. And the predators were Adelie penguins, killer whales, and uh, wet L seals primarily. 
And because these birds and mammals are air breathing, they can only travel a certain distance of the ice edge before they have to turn around and go back and get a breath of air. So they don't have access to most of this region under the ice. Um, neither do oceanographers very easily. And we actually, uh, I was amused to hear Christian's <laughs> uh, challenges with getting some proposals funding. I think we submitted a proposal to work in this area. Um, I can't tell you how many times. Um, on ships, because that's the logical way to do it. Um, we couldn't get funding, there was never ship time, so we decided we could do this by snowmobile. <laughs> and uh, that was a whole challenge in itself. But, so we used remotely operated vehicles, um, which had a camera imaging system, acoustic systems, chlorofluorescence sensors, um, everything that we could use since we couldn't get into the water itself. So this is about the middle of uh, McMurdo Sound. We had a permanent camp there for three months. Um, we had internet. It was very, just like the Hilton. Um, we had an ADCP uh, stuck into the ice uh, to measure current flow. Um, 120 kilohertz acoustic system to get 24 hours um, estimates of uh, fish and krill distributions. This is Mount Erebus in the background. It is an active volcano. Um, but we didn't want to just sample in one space. We wanted to move around. So just like the Wild Wild West, we used a Conestoga wagon, except that it was on skis and we towed it with snowmobiles. <laughs> and uh, this was really a lifesaver because we actually had a little heater in there. Um, this is the drill that we used uh, to drill through the sea ice. It was about one to two meters thick. And everything, all the instrumentation that we had to put through that, it had to fit within a 10 cement hole. So everything we did was dependent on having a system that could do that. So this is our ROV. It's called the skinny ROV because it can fit through a 10 centimeter hole. And, and, the t and then we built a tail. This is my acoustic tail. It had acoustic and fluorescent sensors in it, and that's called Fatty. And this little skinny ROV, uh, we kept it on a tether line and towed it, um, did transects under the ice, and then went down into deeper waters and did continuous transects from there at every station that we went to. So we managed to cover a good part of McMurdo Sound that way, and here you can see our little very cozy Conestoga wagon with one of our ROV drivers. We had this great crew of robotic engineering students who had played um, computer games their whole lives, and they were fantastic <laughs> at driving this thing underwater. Uh, just to show you that we actually did see some of the animals um, that we were trying to assess. Uh, this is the little krill. Whoops. This is the euphousid, euphousia um, crystallorpheus, or crystal krill is its common name. And again, it's, about, it's a small shrimp-like creature, um, but one of the most abundant source of food for whales and penguins and seals. Uh, a relatively large fish called a pleurogramma, called a silverfish. And then we saw lots of different kinds of other um, typical zooplankton, jellyfish, pteropods. Um, and then this is a view looking from the water up on to the undersurface of the sea ice. And there were fish hanging around at that ice water interface. And here you can see some um, colonial phytoplankton, ice algae, hanging down from the undersurface of the sea ice. This is what some of our um, sample output, again, this is that colonial phytoplankton um, that we documented and um, uh, measured the abundance of distribution. This is an acoustic echogram. So this is the surface. Um, red is very high concentrations. Blue is lower concentrations. So surface waters were relatively low in acoustic scatterers. And then there was typically a layer of krill. 
and then um, additional zooplankton uh, down below. And this shows the chlorophyll, um, the variability of chlorophyll along track. So we saw some large blooms while we were there. And then we also put satellite tags on the predators to track their feeding. And this is, you can just barely see a small tag. These tags have gotten much smaller over the years. They used to be these huge things. And whenever they put one on a penguin, nobody else would come even near it because it, it looks so weird. Now they're sort of melding back into their population, although he looks a little <laughs> shocked. <laughs> Um, and then the same thing on uh, killer whales, and you can't just go up to a killer whale and attach a tag, so they use um, um, big, oh, what's it called? Harpoon? Well, basically, <laughs> yeah, it's a big, dart. Dart. well, it's even beyond a dart, oh, there's a name for it, no, it's like a bow, huge bow, crossbow, crossbow, thank you. So a little bit of results. Um, this shows you one of our acoustic echograms. So we did see these large layers of prey. So indeed, um, there's a very large um, colony of penguins, of about um, 5,000 pairs of penguins that live here. And the abundance in this colony has been increasing in recent years, and this is what they primarily feed on. So there is a reason why they are doing well, and there is a good food source. The killer whale population, there's about 150 killer whales, and that population has been steadily increasing. They show up up early December, and they just start patrolling along the ice edge here. And then the Weddell seals feed primarily on the silver fish, and it, they um, create holes in the ice and live primarily up in this region. So early on, um, but these are our station locations, and early on we saw that fish were fairly abundant near the ice edge, which surprised us. Our hypothesis had been that there would be very low concentrations of prey near the ice edge and higher further away from the ice edge, just to um, basically out of range of the air-breathing predators. But it turns out that the circulation flow on this side of the bay is primarily coming out underneath the Ross Shelf. It's extremely cold water, and there were huge, dense layers of fried ice that had formed under the ice. Um, and that's where the fish were hiding. So they had additional um, kind of ways to avoid predation. But you can still see that quite a few were um, denser away from the ice edge. And uh, the krill distribution tended to be more on the Ross Sea side. And then that shifted over time. But when we put all of these data together, indeed, there was a significant difference in the abundance of krill and fish close to the ice edge versus deeper under the ice edge. So the presence of air-breathing predators, that 